morning. Wasn't that an amazing time in worship? Yeah. I just, you know, and um, what's interesting is right literally as she was turning to us to say, okay, we, now we worship, We've, I find out that our Facebook Live is not working uh, at the beginning. And so I'm sitting there trying to, like, figure out why it's not working because it's a connection issue. And, and then, but at the same time, I'm like, I got to be connected to the Holy Spirit, but the live stream's not working. Now, we have other places that it is live, right? But we, liked, we like it to be on Facebook. And, um, and at one point, I looked at Sherry, and I'm like, it's not happening. And so, <laughs> you know, but it, it's interesting because the enemy tried to, to distract us and me, uh, and, and for a moment, he did. And um, it was it was very it was very interesting navigating that with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit. Thank you um, to 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 begin to to tap back into what He wanted for today, and we got there, and it has it was just it was just amazing. I just I'm just completely in awe. Now, Tina, you took my message. But God took your, my message. It's okay. It's confirming. But when well, you're sitting up here like, you're a merchant ship. And I'm like, well, there it is. All right. So um, I'm going to try and wrap several things into the time that we're in. Um, the, the, we, we know as a prophetic house that we've got to understand the times and the seasons We've got to understand um, who we're, who we are, what we're doing, all that kind of stuff. Several months ago, um, I had a message about um, regrouping and recalibrating, but that we recover all. And so, last week, uh, at the very end, I felt like the Lord said, "You're finishing the recalibration to move into recover all." And um, and so I've, I've held that. Uh, I, I listened to Steve Pogue's message as well um, while we were gone. And I was listening to it last night again as I was studying because the Lord told me, it was about Wednesday that the Lord started to tell me what, kind of what, I, was, what I needed to talk about today. And uh, I wanted to listen to Steve's message because I like to, to pull things together of what the Holy Spirit is saying to, to start to put a picture together for, for what, what is he saying right now. And I was listening to it, and if you remember, or you go back and listen, he was talking about Abraham. He was talking about the four altars of Abraham and how each time that Abraham basically had to build an altar, that it was a catalyst for where we are standing today. That if Abraham had not completed, if Abraham had not finished or um, gone through the things that he had to go through, then those things, those the the stars wouldn't have aligned, and the the you know all that kind of stuff to to put us in a, the place that we're at now. And it was not until the very like literally the last sentence that he said that it confirmed what the Lord was saying to me this week, and so. I, uh, the Lord's, the Lord said, actually, let me, let me tell you a story. Um, so we're in the money class on Wednesday evenings and Matt Moore came and he, uh, he's very, um, educated in, uh, cryptocurrency and digital currency and just understanding the new monetary policy that's being, um, being uh, installed into our, into our world. And if you haven't taken the money class, um, we're going to start it again once we finish because it is imperative. Yes. It is imperative that the body of Christ knows and understands the time that we're moving into in our monetary policy. I, I fully believe that it's a part of the wealth transfer. And I fully believe that if you're waiting for riches to just fall out of heaven, you are going to <laughs> miss what God is doing with monetary policy. So um, we'll, we'll announce that when it's starting. But Matt, 
Matt started saying some things, and he, he started to answer questions because it was a Q&A. And all of a sudden, all these light bulbs start going on, off, you know, on, off, whatever. Light bulb goes on across the room, and people are like, oh, I, I understand it now. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there, well, I've told you three times. <laughs> I've told you, like, I've explained this three times, four times. I may have even explained it seven times, but Matt Moore comes and answers a question, <laughs> and all the light bulbs go on. And so... Um, I was kind of uh, um, ruminating on that later that evening, and this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, Matt would not have been able to harvest that understanding if you had not sowed the seed. And so the Lord is like, I want you to talk about seed time and harvest time. And I'm like, you know I'm not going to talk about it like everybody else talks about it, right? Say amen with me. Right, because it is so much bigger than sowing tithe, tithes and offerings. It is so much broader than just, and it's been manipulated by the church, the big C church in general, to get you to pay their bills and, uh, and pay their salaries. And all of that is important. That I'm not saying that, but we've got to understand it's so interesting because the church over time has pigeonholed certain revelations by the Lord into meaning one thing. And when you step back and you realize that the kingdom is very broad and the kingdom is multifaceted and the kingdom is, is you know, it means several different things and several different interpretations. And if you allow your, continue to allow yourself to say the kingdom is multifaceted, it will push the religious spirit away. Because the religious spirit wants one thing. The religious spirit wants one thing because one thing can be controlled. <clears throat> so, um, and, and over the last, I would say, three or four years, I have, uh, you know, and we've just been various people, but I'm going to talk about me for a minute. <laughs> I have sowed seeds of the kingdom. <coughs> and you look across whatever you know, look here, look at people that you're talking to, other pastors that I've talked to about the kingdom, and it's like nobody's home. Like, what you are talking a foreign language to me, but I'm interested. And then three years later, something someone will say will catch the light bulb, and it connects, and I used to get a little irritated about it. And I'm, and I'm going to be honest, I'm still working that journey out. But this revelation that the Lord gave me on Wednesday was, if you hadn't have sowed the seed, then it couldn't have been harvested. And sometimes the sowers are not the ones that reap the harvest. And, um, and so we have to understand that those people can, we can, it can be different people. And it's, it just hit me in a new way this week. Um, it was extremely profound. Um, so it's just kind of like you're sowing the seeds of the kingdom and you're sowing these things. You're, you're talking about abundance. You're talking about how the lack of, uh, po you know, the, the lack spirit and poverty and how the religious spirit and you're, it's all these things are adding up. And there have been moments of discouragement and I you guys are going to, you've experienced moments of discouragement where I've sowed and I've sowed and I've sowed and I and think outside of finance, financial, but I've sowed and I've sowed and I've sowed and nothing has happened. Maybe the Holy, maybe the Holy Spirit wants to reframe our minds that you've sowed, you've done your job and the harvester is coming. And it's so exciting when the harvest happens, right? It's like you, you can see the future. You can see it now. You can see it happening. You're like, oh, I'm just gaining all this wheat. I'm taking it all in, and I'm harvesting, and it's so wonderful. And But the seed time, you have to have faith. You have to have hope. 
You have to see a future that doesn't exist. And so seed time can be extremely difficult when we're in the midst of it. Because we have been taught by church theology that when we sow a seed, we get a harvest. Right? Now that's biblical principle. But we've been conditioned for immediate things. Okay? We've been conditioned that, okay, I'm going to sow this seed. All right. My bills are being paid this week. My bills are not paid this week. I'm going to stop sowing the seed. Okay? I know that as a, as, as a young person that I, actually, I went through that. I went through that cycle of, um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sow seed. Because my limited understanding was, because that's all it was taught, was that it was financial. And so you sow the seed and, and nothing happens. And then, you know, you're just kind of, you know, floundering around. And then you're like, God is like, what's going on here? I'm learning to appreciate sowing seeds. And it became evident on Wednesday night because I love finance. I love talking about digital finance. I love talking about um, monetary policy. And, and I knew because the Lord was telling me, you've got to teach the people this. And so I, I started, and it's so it's so funny and just kind of sad because at the end of every week you're faced with this jaw dropping like oh my gosh they are truly doing this to our monetary system and this like hope for the future and so I've, I've, I'm just learning through this process to sow the seed sow the seed sow the seed and that it's okay and that it'll it'll be okay. What's what's interesting here at Kingdom Rain is that our teaching team and our leadership team, we don't get upset when someone else harvests the seed that was planted by somebody else. And that's that's the reason why we have multiple uh, speakers and multiple people that bring the word and the message is because if the seed is being sown always by the same person, okay then you have the uh, potential to harvest things over and over and over again, and you're just kind of like, there's no new seed. And so it's important for us to have those seeds that are being sown, but also Sherry may say something that I said three weeks ago that everyone's like, oh, I get it now. And so it multiplies the harvest it quickens it. it. It accelerates the harvest. And that's the reason why there's the fivefold ministry. I, and I also think that that's why there has to be the apostolic and the prophetic is because the apostolic and prophetic are mostly the seed sowers. Your evangelist, pastor, teacher, they sow seeds, but most of the time they are, seed har or they are harvesters. And so when you have just the evangelist, pastor, and teacher— Without the apostolic and the prophetic, you keep trying to harvest o the same thing over and over again, and the land gets the land gets you know, depleted and the land gets um, drained, and so you have to have the apostolic and the prophetic. And you try basically you try to to, to um, harvest the same field without planting new seed. And um, knowing my uh, wife, Mandy, is from Illinois, and they have uh, cornfields and bean fields and all this kind of stuff. And what's interesting is they flip-flop the fields. So one year it's corn, next year it's beans. One year it's corn, next year it's beans. Because if you plant corn over corn over corn in the same field, then the, then the minerals that the corn needs to grow becomes depleted because the beans and the corn need different minerals from the, from the soil. And so... The, the you know throughout the uh, parables we understand that there's all these uh, parables about the farmer and the seed and the sower and all of those all of those things and 
you begin to realize the multifacetedness of that entire process. So let's first go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 36. And, uh, and verse 36 starts, he says, Foolish man, don't you know that what you sow in the ground doesn't germinate unless it dies? And what you sow is not the body that will come into being, but the bare seed. And it's hard to tell whether it's wheat or some other seed. But when it dies, God gives it a new form, a body to fulfill his purpose. And he sees to it that each seed gets a new body of its own and becomes the plant he designed it to be. Uh, we were in a meeting yesterday uh, with our visionary team, and we're just having some vulnerable moments. Uh, it's been a little while since we've met, and we've had the pandemic, and we've had the election, and we've had all this stuff, and it was just time to get together. And uh, something Shanae said that was incredibly profound, and um, I, t you know, and the Lord was already kind of talking to me about this sowing and reaping thing, and she goes, it doesn't nothing happens until it dies it's got to die it's got to die and i think that's the thing that a lot of us are missing in the sowing and reaping story is that when you sow it's gone you have to emotionally physically <coughs> detach from it because you don't know if it's going to grow or not We've, just, we've, we've been conditioned as Christians to sow the seed and sit there and watch it. And it takes forever. And it takes so much longer. And you're like, is this ever going to grow? Is this ever? And then what happens is we become stingy with the seed. And so we only plant one or two seeds and watch it grow. But the Lord has actually called us, go sow the seed everywhere. You're going to sow seed in rocks you're going to sow seed in fertile ground you're going to sow seed in the desert you're going to sow seed sow seed sow seed sow seed and it actually says that the more seed that you sow the more he multiplies the seed right so that there's a harvest it what you sow into the ground doesn't germinate unless it dies and you know that is really hard to do um i've had several things in the midst of this last year that you've sown seed and you've sown seed and you've sown seed oh it looks like it's sprouting oh it's not sprouting so seed so seed so oh, looky there look what god's doing and then nothing happens and you're just like all right i gotta emotionally detach from this because i'm gonna go bonkers if I continue watching this or hoping that it that it comes right because we don't know the time that the seed will germinate and we have to we have to understand that we have to 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 put that into our our mindsets that when we sow seed I'm saying this again when we sow seed it has to die it dies <laughs> like it dies <laughs> okay it's dead. It dies. It must die before it sprouts. And not only that, what you thought that seed was when you planted it, it says it's going to come up completely different. And it's going to come up in the way that God designed it to do. So when I see the no one is home signal from people that I'm talking to, and I'm, I'm not trying to be derogatory, please understand that, but when I see the no one's home, when, you're, when I'm talking, it's like, or someone else is talking, it's like, all right, that's just another seed sown. It's just another seed sown. It's just another seed sown. I'm just sowing seed. I'm just sowing seed. And it's, I'm going to say again that I'm beginning to appreciate that process. And I think that we have, as the body of Christ, have to begin to appreciate that process because it also works hand in hand with the poverty spirit and abundance because if you if you think 
that your seed is limited, then you will only sow it sparingly, and you don't know that the seed sown is going to grow. Through, I mean, through all the parables, we, under, we, we see that seed is sown everywhere, and it doesn't always grow. Steve's message, I, I told you about it at the beginning, but at the very, very end, he said that Abraham sowed in the catalyst that we are standing in today by agreeing to sow Isaac. And he said that we must sow all that heaven has given us in the moment that we are in so that it can become the catalyst for harvest. Right. Steve doesn't even remember saying it, but he said it. Steve also said, that Jesus paid for a whole lot more than we've allowed for. And that is where that poverty mentality really starts to, to really come in is because we have a very limited view of what Jesus died for. And because we have a very limited view of what Jesus died for, we don't see the seed available for us to sow. And because we don't see the seed that's available for us to sow, we don't sow it or we only sow it in very small areas when the Lord is saying, I want you to go sow it in the marketplace, but I want to sow my seed in the church. We've been, we've been conditioned to sow your seed in the church. Finance, whether you're um, gifted in singing, whether you're gifted in speaking, whether you're gifted in, it, we've been conditioned that uh, we have to do it in the church. There's uh, an individual that I know that uh, always wanted to speak in the church but there just wasn't enough time for it there's there's just like it, it creates a bottleneck for the process now they spoke occasionally and i'm not necessarily talking about kingdom reign but they they would speak occasionally but it, they wanted more and i said you know you are really gifted prophetically why don't we set up an email list for people to sign up for and you start creating a blog so that you can start multiplying your audience, right? So that you can cast the seed in a broader place than just here. And the concept just didn't, didn't stick. But that is the, we've got to, when we're thinking about sowing and reaping and we're thinking about kingdom and we're thinking about multiplication, uh, just what Christy said, that the, the church is outside the church. The people are outside the church now. And so here we come, we get, we get fed and we get uh, watered and some of the other things that you said. Um, but then we go out to sow the seed. We don't wait and sit on the seed until the next week and then come in here and sow, try and sow it. Right? So the scripture that, that was kind of brought to my attention um, by the Holy Spirit was Ecclesiastics 11, starting in verse 1. And this was before I heard what Steve said. This was before, um, this was after what happened, my story with Matt at the, at the money class. Um, and so I'm just going to read 1 through uh, 6. It says, Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain on the earth. And whether a tree falls toward the south or toward the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. One who watches the wind will not sow, and one who looks at the clouds will not harvest. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes everything. Sow your seed in the morning, and do not be idle in the evening. For you do not know whether one or the other will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. So in, a, in understanding Scripture, we have to always go back to the... Uh, we have to go back to the context. What was being written? What was, what was the time that they were in? And Israel in that time had become 
uh, during Solomon's time had become a trade hub, right, between Egypt and Asia, uh, in India, in Edom, in uh, Judea, in um, Asia, in all of the surroundings. They'd become a, a trade hub, and, and that was from as just an agricultural type of, of of place, they were just kind of in agriculture. They had a few, they had a few um, alignments with some kings in the areas, but Solomon, through the wisdom that the Lord gave him and the promise of riches, created tr- the um, the massive trade routes between all of those. And so, this verse one, cast your bread on the waters. There's another version that says, send the ships out. Send the ships out. And basically, don't worry about if they're coming back, but they'll come back. When a tree falls, in the, falls, don't worry where it falls because it's falling. Right? <laughs> don't wait for perfect conditions to sow the seed. Don't wait for perfect conditions to harvest the harvest. I think we miss I think we miss a lot of Solomon's journey between the promise and the of wisdom and riches and how he got there. Because we've been taught that riches just fall out of heaven because we sowed seed. Like it's just going to happen. It's just going to fall in my lap. Now, there's times that that happens, but you can usually trace it back to seed that you sown that you've sown in other in other areas, right? So it didn't, ju- it didn't just happen. And if you're sitting waiting for something to happen, you are in error. Um, I'm just going to be really bold about that. And so, uh, so Solomon had, through the wisdom, he had to think outside the box. He had to think about, well, Israel is this, like, s- this hub and is central and is, you know, we've got the sea and we've got all of these ports and we've got all these things happening. How can I monetize it? And so he did which created the gold and the silver. It says that silver was so plentiful, and they didn't actually put things in silver because it was so plentiful. It was um, ordinary. Like, can you imagine there being so much silver stacked up that it was ordinary? The overall, the overall theme with this is that God only God develops a good return. So so do it wisely, but don't wait until conditions are perfect. There's a balance between God will take care of it, even though I just use reckless behavior, because this is not a ticket to just like go, you know. Because He also talks about um, throwing pearls of swine, and he, he talks about the wisdom that's needed in in, in sowing seed, and so. We've got a, there's a balance between this reckless abandonment to God and just doing whatever and God taking care of it because I sought out wisdom in the process because there, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures, but there's so many scriptures about wise counsel. There's so many uh, scriptures about um, being good stewards and being those things. So, so it's, uh, and, and Christians, we have a tendency to do this. We grab a hold of an interpretation of, of the scripture and we think that's the only interpretation, and so we run with it full speed ahead, and we don't stop to get some wisdom along the way. And so, uh, one of the one of the things that I've uh, learned in the last year is trading the stock market. And let me tell you, it is not an easy thing to do, especially day trading. And so I, there's times where you're sitting there watching for the trade to happen because you've got you've. You've mapped out your trade. You've mapped out what you're going to do. And you're just kind of sitting there waiting for it to happen. And then my problem is I get bored. And so I move on to another stock to watch. And while I'm watching this stock over here, this one decides that it's ready to go. (laughs) And so um, when I was learning, and and occasionally now, but uh, you, you all of a sudden, your attention's back over here. And then you start chasing the trade, right? You didn't stop and think, is the trade already gone? Has it already happened? You know, what are, the, what are the lessons that I've learned? What are the skills that I've learned in this process to trade the stock market? And if, it's, if the trade's gone, uh, the poverty mentality says the trade will never come back again. 
or that there will never be another setup. And it, I've missed it. And I've missed out making out on my money. And I've missed this. And so you end up jumping into the trade. And as soon as you jump into the trade to chase it, because it's already started moving, it like not only just reverses, but it dumps to the other direction. And you're just like, oh. And then you, then, then, and this is where, this is the, uh, the, the, the gerbil wheel that you kind of get on. So, so it goes up and it starts to dump and you're like, well, don't, it'll come back. <laughs> and then it does it. And you're like, so then you, you could have sold out at a small loss when it, when it, when it reversed, but then you didn't. And so now it's a bigger loss. And so now You've taken a moment where you've mapped out, you've gained wisdom to map out a trade. You got bored. You got, um, you got, you know, disenfranchised from it. And so you move on to something else. And then all of a sudden, this over here starts to move. And you forget all the wisdom. You forget all the training. And you just jump in. And not only have you lost the potential profit already that you could have made in that, you've now lost more than you started with. So that's why it's important that in the midst of sowing the seed and, and, and being the farmer and casting the seed, that we, uh, sur you surround yourself with wisdom and with wise counsel. Let's go to Proverbs 15, uh, 22. It says, your plans will fall apart right in front of you if you fail to get good advice. But if you first seek out multiple counselors, you'll watch your plans succeed. And uh, if you ask my wife, I'm the one that's like, ooh, that's a good opportunity. Ooh, that's a good opportunity. Let's, let's go look over here. And uh, she's always the one that's like, slow your roll, buddy. Let's, uh, let's kind of look at it. Let me ask a few questions. Let me poke holes in your vision and your dream. Let me just, let me just, you dream killer. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, and, and then she's practiced. She's reasonable. She always, she's like, that is not a reasonable, like, let's, let's be reasonable. That's why we're good for each other, right? <laughs> and that's why it's important to have those people around you, especially people that are huge dreamers, huge like visionaries, huge just, it is important to have the people around you that say, hey, <laughs> let's, let's stop and think about this for a minute. Let's take a look here. Yeah. And most of the time, your spouse is the opposite of you. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a good thing, okay? Because if you were both far out dreamers, so you're so exciting. <laughs> if you were both far out dreamers, because what happens is a dreamer sees things done. I've got a, I've got a friend, I've got a friend that everything's handled, everything's done, everything's in motion, everything's everything's good to go. It's already finished. And then I start, and then what's, what's interesting about me also is I have the ability to ask the questions to the dreamer, right? Because I've been taught well. And, um, and, so, and so you start asking questions because I'm also kind of a systems and operational kind of guy. Like, I get the dream, I get the vision, but if you don't install systems and operations to attain and implement to get to the vision and the dream, then the vision of the dream stays a vision and a dream, and the sowing of the dream, right? The telling of people and the, the just casting the casting the the um, the seed becomes like desert because there was not wise counsel in who do I cast this seed to? I cannot tell you how many times I'm going to go back to my friend first. So this friend. I start asking him questions, and then I'm like, this is not handled. This is not done. This is not, and then, and then what happens is 
the enemy starts working in deception and you start feeling like, well, if you haven't told the truth about this, what have you not, what else have you not told the truth about? And that's a whole other message some other time. But we have to have wisdom and counsel to know who to sow seed, who to sow vision and dreams to. Because not everybody is good soil. And not everybody is going to listen to that, right? Now, you may be thinking, like, aren't you kind of contradicting yourself? Because you just told us to told everybody and sow the seed. And But there's a balance. There is a balance. I cannot tell you how many times that I've just opened my mouth, sowed vision, and it, it like, totally falls to the wayside because... It was too soon. It wasn't the Lord didn't tell me to tell that person or, or do this. So it all comes into relationship. It comes into your wise counsel. And it's multifaceted in the sowing and the reaping, right? So Proverbs uh, 19.2. The best way to live is with, is with revelation knowledge, with the prophetic. For without it, you'll grow impatient and want run right into error. This is why the prophetic has to be in place in church this is why you have to now what's interesting is if you have the prophetic without the other gifts <laughs> you have a problem <laughs> because the prophetic is just like the dreamer and they see it done and they see it completed and a lot of times prophetic people do not have the stamina from when they saw the prophetic word to complete it. And it's not, listen, that's not a, I'm not being derogatory. I'm not being mean. But that's why you have to have the other, the other offices working together because the prophetic sees the seasons and the times and they see the, the new seed and, they're, and that's the, the person or the grace God gives the new seed to and then they sow it and then it requires the entire fivefold to come around it to begin to work out the vision, work out the prophetic word, work out the, um, the, 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 the motion and everything like that. Um, and that's why usually the apostolic and the prophetic work well together is because the apostolic and the, it's, I mean, the Bible even tells us it's, it's foundational. The one, you know, one has the seed, one has the vision, the other has, gets strategy and then starts to get the plan and starts to get the things to put together. And then the pastor and the teacher and the, uh, the evangelist come in and start germinating the seed and start bringing other pieces because the evangelist is not just about soul winning. The evangelist is about expanding the kingdom. And so anything that needs expansion must have the evangelistic uh, touch, the graces touch. Because, and that's where, that's kind of the next paradigm that I see the church moving in. We've, we've kind of awakened the apostolic and the prophetic, and now he's rearranging the, uh, the evangelistic. He's rearranging the evangelistic that it is not just about soul winning. That's a piece. But if that's the only, if that's the only goal, then you will only sow evangelistic seed in non-believers. But the evangelist is for the believer and the non-believer. Yeah. Proverbs thirteen sixteen. Everything a wise and shrewd man does comes from a source of revelation knowledge. So again, it comes from the prophetic. But the behavior of a fool puts foolishness on a parade. Everything a wise and shrewd man does comes from the source of revelation knowledge, but the behavior of a fool puts foolishness on parade. That's one of the... Uh, I, had a, I had a friend, I've talked about this before, I had a friend in college, very prophetic, um, but I would... I would my stance with with anything in life is you know uh, you know you got to check your morals and all those kind of things but anything in life if i decide to go do it and i haven't got a red flag from the holy spirit i'm gonna go do it now that puts the pressure on the relationship with you and holy spirit so that you see the red flag when the holy spirit says you're going the wrong direction And it gives you the freedom 
to operate in your grace and your gifts and your space and practice, but it has to be relationship. It can't be a list of rules on how you do this, this, and that, and the other. But this, this friend, I would, you know, I would say, hey, man, you want to go see a movie? And we're not talking about like a PG movie. We're not talking about like an R movie. We're not talking about something that's like, like crazy. Or, hey, man, you want to go to the bowling alley? You know, just you know, <laughs> throw the ball. <laughs> I don't know. I need to pray about it. And I'm like, do you want to go? <laughs> like, I, I just didn't understand it at all. And there's people like that that I still, I, I will never understand that. Um, but, but there are... But there are people um, that they're, they're, and they may be a season of time where the Holy Spirit is micromanaging their gift. Because he's training them. And so we have to be aware of that. Of the, of the season that they're in. Now, there's other people that they're like, I heard God say, or they use God to get out of things they don't want to do. I'm like, just tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just be honest with me, please. Um, One of the things that I see in the, the, the church as a whole is the church is in this, I said this at the beginning, but the church is in this recalibration moment. Um, there are some churches that didn't make it out of the pandemic. There are some churches that closed down that never opened back up. Um, there are some churches that are so surrounded in fear of what the government is going to do to them that they um, basically are in shackles. And then you've got the, the, some churches that are like, what's the law? Um, yeah. So, balance. But there's this recalibration that's going on within the church in this new era. We've prophesied it. We've talked about it. We've, we've preached about it. We've yeah. all this kind of stuff. And so it makes sense that we would have to go through a moment of recalibration before we step into it. Because if we step into the new era with voices that are not speaking what Holy Spirit has recalibrated us to, then it's like lost seed. It's like sowing. It's like he just, and I, and I really believe the Lord is, um, he's, he's always wise in his, his seed sowing, but he's, he's extre being extremely, um, uh, like a good businessman with the seed that he is sowing it for this next season because the stakes are extremely high and he's he's preparing his bride for it could be 50 years from now it could be 100 years from now but he's preparing his bride for him to come but he's also preparing the church for the outpouring that's coming that I would say is here. Yeah. <laughs> it's seed in the ground. Mm. We just don't see it yet. And it's not going to look like it's going to have a different body on it. The revival of this generation is going to have a different body on it than the revival of the last generation. Yeah. And if you're looking for the same body and looking for it to look the same, you will not find it and you will miss it. Insert God's grace and mercy in there for you to change your ways. <laughs> Can you imagine if the farmer in the parable, uh, if the farmer was like, ooh, there's rocks over there, but I'm not going to throw it over there. But there was this little bitty patch of fertile ground. Imagine if he only sowed it all in the fertile ground. There's too much seed to take up all the nutrients. And so the seed in the harvest is weak. So it's, it's not just about just, just sowing, but it's understanding the mechanics of farming, 
understanding the mechanics of of how we how we move and how we have our being in the kingdom of God in the process of sowing and reaping. In the in our in our lives, just in general, we've been conditioned not to fail. Uh, religious spirits as well as society has trained us that failure is bad. Yet, every person that has been successful in their life tells you that failure is the best thing that happened to them. That failure is something to be appreciated. So failure is something to be wanted. Failure is something to, like, you know, stand on top of, right? Not in a, like, oh, look, at I failed. But it's <laughs> not this pity victim thing. But it's a, but it is a, a moment for you to stand on top of failure and say, I learned something here that I'm taking on. And because we've been conditioned, the religious spirit is awful with this. It will, it will put, you, it'll squeeze you and mold you into a box of behavior that you can't move, and it's micromanaged so much that you can't fail. You know, uh, the school that the school that we went to uh, growing up, uh, it was a, it was a homeschool co-op, and we were the outsiders. We were the we were the mom let us have sugar, and we watched uh, home Home Alone, and we watched uh, Home Home Improvement, and and um, you know we weren't in you know everyone didn't sit around the the table every night because we were in ministry, you know all that stuff, and so. Um, <laughs> you know, the things that you realize now that while we were going through it, completely oblivious to it, but they judged them completely because we weren't, you know, they, they weren't controlling our every move and our every behavior, our everything that we did. And um, now there's some, you know, she's mellowed a lot more than she was back then, <laughs> but there were moments where they allowed us to make our mistakes. And th that's the beauty of the Father and of God. He allows us to make mistakes. And then we learn from those mistakes. And then we're rewarded for the success of learning from the mistake. I went to college... All of the all of the members of my graduating class, all seven of us, um, we all went to college. I think I'm one of three that uh, graduated, and um, several of them went to college where they no longer had mom and dad's thumb on top of, and they went bonkers, they went nuts, um, drinking, alcohol, promiscuity. I mean, you just, I mean, and, and watching it all, and you're looking, and you're realizing the goodness that God was to our family, even in the midst of not knowing what, we, you, know, what you guys were doing most of the time, to realize that the religious spirit was already having a hard time attaching on to just sit down and behave. We've got to be able to. We've got to be able to fail. We've got to be able to make mistakes. The the prophetic, especially here, this is a practicing prophetic house, right? And so there are people that get it way wrong, right? And in a lot of other prophetic places, if you get it wrong once, you're done. Sit down. It's like it's like they. It's like we don't realize that in every cycle, that there's a child a youth, a young adult, a um, middle-aged adult, and a mature adult. In everything that the Lord does, that cycle exists. And if someone new, the, new to the prophetic makes a mistake as a child in the prophetic, and we sit them down and we say, shut up, and we say, you got it wrong, and you, you didn't hear it right, and we don't train, and we don't teach, and we don't uh, create opportunities for more practice. 
then we're not doing we're not doing the sowing and reaping that we're called to do here at Kingdom Reign. Now, that's two part, right? Because if someone in the prophetic knew that the prophetic, because we're all human, makes a mistake, and we and we're you know we've got to have the tact and the ability to have that conversation, like, hey, we love you, and we're so glad that you're here. And we're so glad that you're a part of our of, of our of our body, um, but we need to have a we need to have a conversation, and um, letting the love and the relationship of the Lord work, and and both parties allowing that that space to do so, right? Yeah. Fear of failure can cause you to not sow the seed or to not harvest. So as far as not sowing the seed, fear of failure will cause you to hoard the seed because it might not work out. Fear of failure will, will cause you to not harvest because of some weird, like, like if I harvest this, there's not any more. Like, because we're so linear in thinking and because we're not, we don't understand. Now, I think we understand better because we are understanding the Hebrew nature of how how the Lord moves in cycles, and uh, that His calendar is cyclical. We go from blessing to blessing, you know, all those kinds of things. And so we're understanding the cyclical nature of God and the way that He moves. But because we've been taught in a linear uh, pattern, we see sowing and reaping as this beginning and end, and then there's no more. But the Lord, through Scripture, multiple places says. If you steward my little, I will give you much. And because it's, and we've seen that as, we've seen that as beginning and end as well. But because the, the Lord is cyclical, the much becomes little, right? right? Right. And also first fruits is you take seed from the harvest in proportion to the harvest to sow for a future harvest. So that the seed is continually being multiplied and you're continually sowing and you're continually putting forth all that kind of stuff. Okay? I've got a couple more minutes, so stay with me. So fear can cause three things. Fear can cause apathy. Who cares? Whatever. Just sow the seed. You know, I don't even care if it grows or it doesn't grow. It just, and, you know, just like, yeah, you get me. Who cares? Whatever. I don't care if I have seed today or tomorrow. It doesn't matter. Uh, despair. Fear can cause despair. Is there any hope for tomorrow? <laughs> is, there, is, is there a tomorrow? <laughs> you know, if I, sow, if I sow this seed. Now, let me tell you, people that have the, the paradigm of we're all getting raptured out of here, you know, they never sowed seed because what if they sowed seed and the heart and they weren't there for the harvest That's right. so it stopped an entire generation from sowing the seed that they were called to sow because they were waiting to get up out of here and so the the great harvest the great harvest <laughs> was them getting out of here so i'm the seed i'm gonna get harvested let me get up <laughs> anyway And number three, reckless abandonment. Let's just party because the ship's going down anyway. Right? You know, the, it's all going to hell in a handbasket, so just ca throw caution to the wind, and let's just, you know. And what's, what's interesting is I saw all three of those things this last year in people. Right? This apathy of, like, like who cares, this depression, that, that, and depression is very real. I'm not making light of depression. But this depression of like, I don't even, you know, we're all dying and the world is ending and, and all that kind of stuff. Despair of like, when is this going to end? Is there, are we all, you know, the, I think the first, uh, the first um, numbers that were coming out was like the U.S. was going to lose like two to five million people or something like that. And um, uh so this just despair, like, we're going to lose this huge portion of our population. And then this just, like, like, <laughs> you know, spend all the money, rack up the credit, 
just do it all right now because we're all we're you know we're not living past uh, December 31st <laughs> and in Matthew 25 fear caused the the one servant to bury the seed and what's interesting in all in that in that parable in that passage is that uh, when he when the master came back and said you could have at least put it in the bank Right? So number one, that shows that he trusts people over institutions. Right? He, he trusted his servants with seed, not even knowing if they were going to do anything with it. And so that is where this, you know, those that, you know, because you stewarded this and you doubled my, my investment, now I'm going to give you, there's some passages that also talk about, I'm going to give you command over 10 cities. I'm going to give you influence over an incredible portion of my, of my kingdom. And then there's the person that didn't sow at all because they were afraid of what might happen if they didn't turn a profit. Or maybe they had, maybe they had, um, dis, maybe they had a lack of ability in their skill or a lack of, um, of confidence in their skill to go out and to turn a profit. And so they just didn't do anything with it they they buried it and he's he's took that from them took their um kind of took their status and then also gave what they were supposed to do to somebody else and i'm just saying we're not going to do that we're not going to take the seed that's been sown we're not going to take the the you know the prophetic words that have been sown and bury them because we're we're moving now we're gonna have you know uh what's interesting is as i was putting these notes together our our visionary meeting yesterday really surrounded um items of like we've had all this prophetic word we've had all this revelation we've had all this stuff to do and we're talking about kingdom reign like let's go do something with it let's 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 do something with what god has said and the uh the and i've been a extreme proponent and really protected the movement of kingdom reign and we're not going to do something just to say that we're doing something we're going to do it because the seed is actually starting to sprout and we're we can kind of start to see the body and then we move and then the lord does it but the period between the revelation and the seed being sown and the germination and the seed sprouting, what does it say? It basically says we're not going to know when it's going to sprout. But we need to be aware. We need to be, we need to be mindful. We need to be looking. We need to be, um, um, uh, you know, ready for when that seed starts to sprout. If we don't sow, if we stop sowing seeds and we stop sowing the prophetic and we stop sowing revelation, then he's going to stop giving it to us. And we've seen that in churches. You've probably been a part of churches that have, that that's happened. And I, for, for me and for the the space that I that I'm kind of over at Kingdom Reign and just the uh, the corporate church in general, I'm making a declaration that we will not stop receiving revelation. We will not stop praying. We will not stop uh, pushing forward. We will not stop. We will continue to sow. It's so amazing. There was a gentleman here a couple of weeks ago that that came in. I think he was sitting right around here, and the prophetic just flowed right over him. And it was seed being sown, and we may never actually see the harvest of that. I can, m mom can tell you story after story of story of story of people that have come into here, and people that have received the prophetic and the commissioning of the Lord, and then we never see them again. But then we'll see them three or four years later, and they'll say, that moment changed my life. That moment right there was a pivotal paradigm shift in my life.
Imagine if Esther had waited for the perfect condition to sow and to save her people. Imagine if Paul and Barnabas just decided these afflictions are crap. We're done. (laughs) And of course, imagine if Jesus decided that he wasn't going to be split into a million pieces for the savior saving of the world. Everything that we see within the sowing and reaping principle in the Bible was a catalyst for the future. The people in the Bible did not see today, but they knew the seed, they knew the prophetic words that they were saying, they knew what they were doing was a catalyst and a seed for a future harvest. And we've got to understand that. We don't understand inheritance very well as the body of Christ. We don't understand multiplication very well as the body of Christ because we've been taught to not. We've been taught that it's just going to happen and that you just consume it all and it's going to be there tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. But Ecclesiastes 11 says, you know, divide your portion into seven pieces, maybe eight. Because you'd never know. Sow the seed. Because you don't know what will succeed or what won't. But maybe both of them will. And I just, as we're moving into this, I can feel the uncertainty, right, especially right now, because we're, we're coming up on a year of the shutdown. The, uh, I can feel the uncertainty in the markets <laughs> the last two weeks for sure. I can feel the uncertainty in the church. And I can feel the enemy standing there if I can get them to shut down. If I can get them to stop sowing. If I can get them to, to be in fear again. If I, can, if I can continue to do this, then the enemy is saying, then I've stopped the move of God. But I'm making an apostolic declaration that the enemy doesn't get to stop the move of God because there are people that are mature, that understand the impulses of the Holy Spirit, that understand when to sow and when to reap, that understand then and gain wisdom and gain understanding and, and gain um, an ability to move and have their being with the Holy Spirit, right? And my prayer for you guys, if you'll go ahead and stand up with me, my prayer for you for you is that even in the midst of your jobs and your lives and whatever the Lord is moving in you, I can tell you that, you know, Mandy and I are looking at another set of seeds to sow. And um, vulnerable, vulnerably, you're like, I don't know if I have the energy to sow more seed. But because there's a council of wisdom because there's a body of Christ that's moving together because there is and you get to tap into that you get to tap into now I don't know everything that's going on in your lives right but I do know that if you called me in a dire emergency I promised you I'd be there now don't take advantage of it Not everything's an emergency. But what I'm saying is you have family here. We are a family. We we move in ways that not a lot of bodies move because of the family unit. And I'm telling you that this family will continue to sow seed. We will continue to, uh, to see ministries flourish. We will continue to move in the prophetic. We will continue to move in his revelation because what if, what if everything that we sowed is a catalyst for what heaven wants to do on this earth? What if every seed that you part with that you don't know if you're, if you're getting seed tomorrow, but you part with it knowing and understanding that you, that could be the seed that is the catalyst for an entire movement. I think about Azusa. 
the seeds that were sown. Think about the Toronto uh, revival. The seeds that were sown and in a moment, in a moment, it came and it sprouted. And the people that sowed the seeds, the person that harvested, that harvested the Toronto movement was not the person that was sowing the seeds. The person that harvested the Azusa moment, now God harvests all, but, but hear what I'm saying. The person that sparked that moment was not the people that had been sowing seed after seed after seed after seed. We are an apostolic prophetic body, so it, it makes uh, sense that we would see more seed going out. It makes sense that we would see more prophetic revelation moving because we never know what prophetic word, what revelation, what moment is going to be the catalyst for someone that changes their life forever. Forever. And I want you to know you're a part, we're a part of something much bigger. Much bigger than the 60 to 80 people in this room. We are, we are a part of something much, much bigger. The Lord promised us and, and, and told us that we would be like Great Britain. We would be small, but we would be mighty. We would be small, but we would be mighty. And I'm telling you what, this is a mighty group of people. You are a mighty group of people. We are unique. We are different. We are, we are, come from all walks of life. But I'm telling you, it is so exciting because I've realized that we're going to keep sowing the seed no matter what appears as the harvest because we will be a catalyst. We are a catalyst for the move of God across this nation and across the nations of the world. And you get to be a part of it. It's so exciting. Father, I just, I just thank you. I honor you. I bless you, Lord. Thank you so much for your revelation and your wisdom in the midst of chaotic moments, Lord. Thank you so much for, for um, everything that you're doing in the lives of everyone here and everyone that's listening online. Father, thank you for the family. Thank you for family understanding. Thank you for how we operate and how we move, Lord. Thank you so much for showing up every single time we get together. And Father, we make this decree and we make this promise that we will continue to show up. We will continue to show up. Even if we don't understand, even if we don't want to, even if we don't aren't seeing the, 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 uh, the sprouts of harvest, Lord, but we will continue to show up and we will continue to receive the multiplied seed from you and continue to sow it into the ecclesia and continue to sow it as the legislative body on this earth. And Father, I thank you for everyone that sacrifices their time and everyone that sacrifices their, uh, um, sacrifices their gifts to join in the tapestry of what you're doing, not only in Kingdom Reign, but in Tulsa, in the surrounding cities, and in our nation. Father, bless them and bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.